has been a lengthening journey, a continuing odyssey. The pioneers of naval air helped create the age of flight. They led us away from the beginning, through the darkness of the unknown. They were rare men. On fragile ships of wood and wire, they rode their dreams into reality, into the present where they remain, their names alive among us still. Ellison, Rogers, Towers, Cunningham, Smith, Chevalier, Bellinger, Billingsley, Murray, Muston, McIlvain, Richardson, Softly, Bronson, Whiting. They were called Eagles. The naval aviators of today are the direct descendants of the pioneers. Their wings a golden reminder of the past, the wings of eagles. Pensacola, Florida, a city that remembers the beginning, a name synonymous with the growth and development of naval aviation. In the official chronology is recorded the following. January 20th, 1914. The aviation unit from Annapolis under Lieutenant J.H. Towers arrived in Pensacola to set up a flying school. A flying school. Since 1914, they have come here by the tens of thousands flight students, inheritors of the dream. Flight training is a school for survival, a unique proving ground. In every aspect, there is a purpose, a reason for each chartered challenge along the road. A naval aviator must know wind and weather, understand the stresses of heat and cold, be able to function and survive on land and sea. He must know the elements and command them all. Most of all, he must master himself. It is another of the constants, one of the things that does not change. The demands of basic and pre-flight are perhaps the most rigorous of all. A man with his head in the clouds is asked to keep his feet on the ground. It is asking a great deal. What is the force that sustains the flight student through the long hours of classroom and theory? Perhaps it is a dream. That vision in his mind's eye that links him with the eagles of the past and to a future all his own. Randy Cunningham and Bill Driscoll are eagles of today. Pilot and radar intercept officer, RIO. They are the first dual aces, a designation hard won in skies over North Vietnam. They share their past with flight students of the present, the eagles of the future. I'm sure Randy would agree with this. There are some things in the air combat maneuvering environment that are always the same, that don't change. There are certain attitudes and philosophies that were the same in World War I and World War II and today. There are, are some refinements and subtleties, of course, in the jet age that certainly did not exist back in the propeller age. But in the final analysis, it's, it's one man in a, in a machine versus another man in a machine. And there are certain things that we could talk about in fighter air-to-air -air tactics and we could talk with a World War I fighter pilot or a World War II fighter pilot, and the things that we would talk about would be almost exactly identically the same. We, we have a, a firm belief at the Navy Fighter Weapons School, the first man to see the other man is probably gonna win, and if he doesn't win, he's probably not gonna lose, be it on radar or be it through eyeball. Times uh, have changed a little since the time of Rick Tobin, uh, Oswald Boca, 
uh, Immelman, oh. Galan, and uh, since the time of McCampbell, the, the biggest difference that we face is that we only saw MIGs three times. At one time, there was a mass of MIGs up. But uh, when McCampbell was flying, they had large formations going against large formations. Uh, they brought 100 and raised you two. Man against man, plane against plane. It is a familiar litany. The past influences the present and affects the future. This is the true story of the Naval Aviation Museum, a progression of history that can be felt and heard as well as seen. Displaying superb airmanship and extraordinary heroism, inspiring leadership, the President of the United States, in the name of the Congress, takes pleasure in presenting the Medal of Honor, a record of brilliant successes in aerial combat achievement unsurpassed in this war. By courageous, determined, and inspiring efforts in the face of utmost danger. Within these walls, the span and scope of naval aviation becomes a single fabric, a three-dimensional tapestry that weaves and blends together across the years, ships and planes, men and events. It is a voyage through space, a trip in time. We make the journey guided by the eyes of eagles, men who with their lives wrote what will be found along the way. In November 1910, Eugene Ely, a civilian pilot flying a Curtis Pusher, took off from a wooden platform built over the bow of the USS Birmingham, anchored in Hampton Roads. Naval aviation was underway. In the beginning, the tools at hand were barely adequate. The men were better, far better, than the machines. Eight years before Lindbergh, the NC-4 flies the Atlantic, bringing the world closer together. The Navy's first carrier, USS Langley, becomes the realization of commitment to the air, as well as the sea. second generation to put into action the vision of the pioneers. Such men as Robert Peary, later a vice admiral and deputy chief of naval operations for air. I completed flight training in uh, August of 1929 and was ordered to Fighting Squadron 3 in the Lexington. At that time, the Lexington and Saratoga had just been in commission about one year, and uh, together with the Langley, the first carrier, were the only two carriers in commission. One or two months after being indoctrinated in the airplane, the F-3B, I qualified on the Langley in carrier landings. It was a very interesting period from the standpoint of the pioneers and the great early naval aviators, many of whom were on duty during that period. America in the early 30s. A small, exuberant naval air arm tests its wings with unbounded enthusiasm. The world struggles with depression. The horizon darkens. Some nations appear to discover strength in dictatorship. It is a strange, disquieting time. A young man from Mount Willing, Alabama, patrolled the fringes of this twilight world from the cockpit of a PBY. Thomas Moore would one day command the Pacific and Atlantic fleets, would be chief of naval operations, and serve as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Such lofty heights were far away and unimagined. The year is 1941. In those days, uh, without radar, all searches were by eye. And this meant two things. One, you could only search in the daytime. And two, uh, one could only take a sector of about nine or 10 degrees around the compass. 
Uh, for instance, this would have meant that it would take uh, 36 aircraft on continuous patrol to uh, cover the area in the approaches to Pearl Harbor. And consequently, the probability of detecting a specific ship under those conditions was very low. I was at Pearl Harbor when the war began. We lost uh, practically all of our aircraft from strafing and bombing on the ramp on Fort Island. There was just total chaos in the harbor. Oil was burning all over the place. Actually, uh, black oil was uh, two or three inches thick all the way around Pearl Harbor. As the Japanese uh, progressed in their invasion of the entire southeast area, the uh, fighting became more intense. And uh, my uh, major experience occurred on the 19th of February when I was patrolling in search of the Japanese aircraft carriers. And suddenly I encountered a flight of nine zeros. And these uh, aircraft were equipped with a 20 millimeter fragmentation projector, which uh, had a very slow uh, velocity. I could see the damn things. And uh, they came right into the uh, cockpit, right over my shoulder, right into the uh, instrument panel. An aroused nation armed. But an arsenal of democracy cannot be created overnight. Flying from USS Hornet, Army Air Force B-25s strike at the home islands, at Tokyo itself. In the Pacific, the Navy buys time with hit-and-run raids. Captain David McCampbell, Medal of Honor, Navy Cross, 34 victories, leading ace in the history of naval air. Through the fiery skies of the Southwest Pacific, Dave McCampbell and those who flew with him brought us to the turning point. Exotic names in haunting counterpoint to scenes of violence and death. Carrier forces multiply, becoming vast armadas whose fleets of aircraft darken the skies and hasten the end. Normandy, Saipan, Lady Gulf, Luzon, Guam, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, the Inland Sea. Names that will not be forgotten landmarks on the road to victory. For the carriers, most of them, the victory soon turns to silence. 165 aviation ships are on active service at war's end. The number quickly falls to less than two dozen. Yet men do not forget is Admiral John Thatch, fighter pilot, squadron commander, one of the architects of victory in the air in the Pacific. Jimmy Thatch is one of those who will forever hear the sounds of yesterday. On the port bow, Dave. Up or down? Dally ho. One Kawanishi, repeat. One Kawanishi, follow me. Go below the clouds. Go below the clouds, Hank. Oh, yeah. I see him. Box him in. Box him in. A little to the right and down. Down. To the west of you. I'm going in now. Flight quarters. Man your flight quarters stations. flight that crew was a thing of beauty. The 
the Wildcats and the Hellcats and the Corsairs, we used to call them bantwing birds. So many things happening at once, all coordinated, with a tempo and rhythm like a ballet. Bridge combat. We hold a large bogey at 275, 85 miles. The combat bridge. This is the captain speaking. <laughs> erupts in Korea, ships and planes are not so easily found. Once again, brave men stand ready. Vice Admiral Bill Hauser, currently Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Air, was part of the nucleus of resistance, one of the stubborn few. Corsair meant home to me at that time. It's a rugged airplane. It was fast for its time and powerful, very versatile. It served as a good fighter and as a good attack airplane or bomber. And the Corsair uh, was a veteran. It had survived World War II, and of course these were improved models of the same airplane. It was known as the Bentwing, or the Bentwing Monster, the Hog. The Corsair, I think, will remain one of the most remarkable airplanes ever developed. The Navy air-to-air -air action in Korea was limited. Principally, this was a war of close air support, of attrition, of deep interdiction. Korea was a war against a land power, not a sea power, as we saw in World War II, in support of another land power. And the Navy did get in and conduct sustained operation for over three years. Task Force 77 was composed of one carrier at the beginning of the Korean War. This was in a period of much reduced forces after World War II. This carrier, USS Valley Forge, had just sortied from Hong Kong for the Philippines when the Korean War broke out. The Valley Forge and HMS Jupiter, another carrier, made the first strikes against North Korea. of transition. In the years following Korea, years of peace, naval aviation begins to extend itself, to seek new directions and conquer old forbidden frontiers. It is the genesis of an age of acceleration, records and research, experiment and exploration. It is a time when the improbable becomes routine. Project test pilot during C-130 carrier trials aboard USS Forrestal is Commander James Flatley III. Famous son of a famous father, Admiral Jimmy Flatley, World War II ace and fighter tactician. Jim Flatley has logged more than 1,300 arrested carrier landings and commanded a squadron in Vietnam without the loss of a single aircraft. Father and son, the Flatleys symbolize the passing of the torch, the continuity of naval aviation from one generation to the next. Vietnam. At first, it's an irritation, a mild intrusion of the national consciousness. That would change. For those who are there, Vietnam means participation in a bitter conflict that seemingly is without end. July 18, 1965. Mission, military installations a few miles south of Hanoi, near the famous bridge at Tan Hoa. Planes in 
and crews return to the carriers. Commander Jerry Danton is not among those who come back. In the prison cages of North Vietnam, an eternity of enduring begins. With him, thousands of miles apart, others endure no less, their lives suspended in an agony of waiting. While for some the world stands still, for others the earth is but a point of departure and then a destination. Apollo lifts the heart of America and touches the soul of man. The interlude is brief. Advance and innovation. Positive accomplishments are obscured in the swirling controversy of Vietnam. The whole country welcomes you. We're so glad to have you back and so thankful for what you and all of you have done for us. We are honored to have had the opportunity to serve our country under difficult circumstances. We are profoundly grateful to our Commander-in-Chief and to our nation for this day. God bless America. God bless America. and tragedy. Often they are found in close proximity. These two will be a part of the new Naval Aviation Museum, part of a living heritage of the deeds of man. For machines, time is the enemy. Where are the ships and planes of yesterday? Gone, abandoned, neglected, forgotten, most but not all. The Naval Aviation Museum is a commitment to the rediscovery of history. History is a place. For the machines, a process of recovery begins. What is actually involved is more, much more, than the restoration of aircraft. The Naval Aviation Museum is a focal point for the sweeping panorama that is the story of naval air, a gathering of eagles. For the machine, skill and patience are given their reward. A dimension, time, is successfully challenged. The enemy has been defeated. The reality of yesterday is now. If one person could somehow represent the advancement and achievement of the years of naval aviation, that singular individual could well be this man, Captain Charles Pete Conrad. United States Navy, retired. I actually started doing some of my first flying myself in the N3N as a boy. I was born in 1930. At that time, we'd hardly exceeded a couple of hundred miles an hour uh, and hardly gotten above 25, 30,000 feet. And by the time I got to college to take aeronautical engineering, we had at that point just begun to break the sound barrier. 
And by the time I got to uh, flight training in 1953, they were just beginning to go twice the speed of sound. And then in 1960, 61, and 2, we went into space. That's a very short time span. We've gone a, a great way. In order, the Odyssey of Pete Conrad is the Odyssey of Naval Aviation. From the training fields of Pensacola, from the deck of a carrier, to the surface of the moon. I got some kind of a horizon out there. I got some craters, too, but I don't know where I am yet. Okay. And a five for 64. Okay. I'm just trying to cheat and look out there. I think I see my crater. Hey, baby. I'm not sure. Coming through seven. Look at B-64, B-64. Hey, there it is. There it is. Oh, my God. Right down the middle of the road. Outstanding, Pete. Hey, it's starting it right from the center of the crater. Look out there. I can't believe it. Amazing. Fantastic. That's what I see sitting on the side of the crater. Well, surveyor, huh? Well, surveyor, yes, sir. <laughs> Does that look neat? It can't be any further than 600 feet from here. I can walk quite well. Seems a little weird, I'll tell you. Hey, Al, you can work out here all day. Just take your time. For the peak Conrads of this world, nothing is beyond reach. There are no barriers, just challenges. Only the planets are left in their precarious isolation. Beyond them, only the stars remain. Waiting. Waiting. journey is over. The Odyssey ended. Or is it? For naval aviation, the Odyssey, the journey, may have just begun.